Hello, and welcome to the Filmography Club podcast. I'm Jason Cavanis. Every season, we'll be looking at the work of one particular filmmaker, and we'll be looking at their filmography in chronological order, movie by movie, episode by episode. This season's filmmaker, Paul Thomas Anderson. Whenever anybody's asked me what my favorite movie is, I have very proudly said Boogie Nights. And while it's sometimes a surprising answer for folks, uh, being a movie about porn, uh, (laughs) um, I have always felt vindicated in that choice just because of the time that I saw it, right? I was 18 years old. I saw it in the theater in 1997. And it completely, just like the old Max old cassette tape ads, blew me backwards in my seat in terms of the sheer energy that this movie let loose, not only just in the first part, but in the sort of unraveling in the second part, I just felt up and down and torn all around. Yeah, uh, it's probably my favorite movie, too. I have a bunch of movies that I kind of claim as my favorites, and I don't want to put them in order, but gun to my head, it, it's it's probably Boogie Nights. It's got a momentum to it that I just, it, it's hard to come by, um, most other filmmakers. And I don't think he's matched this momentum since. He's made... I think six other movies since then, and they're all fine movies, and we'll get into those later this season. But uh, this one just, it's its like Keith Moon on the drums. You know, it's just, it just propels forward. You're just along for the ride. You just kind of have to hold onto your seat and just, just go with it. It's fucking wonderful. Yeah, all, it, the, all of the sort of uh, slow burnness of Heart 8, you know, he just did a 180 in terms of, all right, I'm just going to have a complete balls of the wall, fun time. He had sat on this story for, you know, 10 years, you know. I mean, he'd done the Dirk Diggler story when he was 17. Yeah, he created that universe, yeah. Yeah, nice which uh, I know we kind of touched on that in the last episode, but uh, but it's worth going a little bit back in time to that piece. Yeah, uh, 1987, shot on video, uh, heavily influenced by uh, Spinal Tap. Sp- uh, heavily influenced by Spinal Tap, uh, the Zelig. And the whole sort of faux documentary, you know, the, the mockumentary right. style is what he kind of picked up on. And it was uh, inspired in two parts, one by John Holmes and all of the sort of immersion that he had done in porn, which apparently he saw his first porn movie when he was nine years old. Uh, who? Paul PTA? Thomas Anderson. Okay. Uh, the opening of Misty Beethoven, like out of his father's like collection, huh. right? <laughs> okay. So that that speaks volumes just in terms of the sheer breadth of media that he was exposed to from a very young age. Yeah. Um, but the John Holmes thing, it's like I've never gone all the way back into that whole milieu, everything that he was like taking into his brain. You know, he he had a an, an encyclopedic knowledge of every John Holmes movie could, you know, quote scenes and tell you exact scenes from the from those movies. But it was a combination of that and him seeing a uh, current affair news thing. It was an old news magazine deal. You, right. you may remember that. Yeah, yeah I but, remember it. Uh, about, it's kind of like Inside Edition, I think. Exactly, yeah. exactly. And in it, there was a story of, you know, the age-old person that moves to L.A. and sort of falls into the dark end of the uh, gutter, right, and gets involved with porn and drugs and everything, and it's a tragic story. And so that was the impetus in terms of Zelig and Spinal Tap and this current affair sort of uh, descent into the uh, California, Los Angeles underworld that led him to uh, do the Dirk Diggler story of which, you know, having a name like that, you know, arriving at that name was enough to just hinge everything around that story on. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. And uh, just as a sidebar, can we just talk about how great he is with coming up with names? His character names are just fantastic across the board. How is there not already a porn star named Amber Waves? That That's just, it writes itself almost. For I mean, sure. Jimmy Gator, that's perfect. Come on. He, good names, good names. Throughout. I mean, uh, uh, Dirk Chester Diggler, Rockwell. Chess Rockwell, Brock Landers. Uh, <laughs> what's the other one? Becky Barnett. Becky Barnett. Becky Chocolate. Barnett. Chocolate Love. Mm-hmm. That's my love. <laughs> um, Jack Horner. You know, I didn't get that joke until earlier this year. Jack Warner, one of the founding Warner brothers. Really? Because I thought that, uh, and I don't remember the exact reference point, but there was a porn director or porn actor with the last name Horner that was partially an influence as well. That wouldn't surprise me, but I always got that mixed up with um, Big Lebowski came out the same year, if I'm not mistaken. Mm-hmm. And there was Jackie Treehorn who was a producer of pornography also in that movie. Well, and I used to get those two things mixed up because both of those movies came out around the same time. But, I mean, yeah, I, I watched a documentary about the Warner Brothers, and 
It's like, oh, Jack Warner. Uh, I feel dumb. I think it's a reasonable reference point for sure. Uh, it's a it's a movie about Hollywood and it's a movie about family and it has all the ingredients of the things that we were touching on in, in, in Hard Eight effectively. All of that childhood sort of exposure to not only celebrity and Hollywood and the dark side of Hollywood. He's a whore effectively for all kinds of media. <laughs> sure, sure. I mean, um, I've read where he would watch porn. One, because he was a 17-year-old horny teenager, but two, because he could watch it and just just see what not to do in film, just things that don't work. Like, oh, look at this. They just cut straight ahead into this bedroom, and what's the house look like? We got no establishing shot. This is bullshit. So it was kind of an example of what not to do in film, too, I suppose. There's the whole porn aspect of this, but it's secondary. It's a jumping off point, really, you know? I mean, he's, af- he's, a- he's after something different in terms, of, uh, in terms of the movie as a whole and what he's wanting to communicate. And what I feel like, you know, in, in us talking about Heart 8 and, per- you know, you could perhaps talk about other movies around subtext and around, you know, this meaning that. I mean, obviously there's the surrogate family business and all that sort of stuff and masculinity and et cetera. But, uh, but I can't help but still, even today, after revisiting it, feeling that it was just about having a balls the wall good time. It's um, a funny movie. It's an extremely funny movie. It's hilarious. And you can just you can feel the them on the set just cracking up. And in fact, I mean to jump to uh jump way ahead where uh Philip Baker Hall's character is in the the scene where he's telling Jack Horner that the video business is really where it's at and that's where we're going and he's uh, arguing with him about it and he says, you know, uh, I, you know, I'm a simple man, Jack. I like butter in my ass, <laughs> lollipops in my mouth. <laughs> and you can see Robert Ridgely in the background just completely cracking up, just trying to hold yeah. it together. Uh, it's like that. And uh, William H. Macy, after coming upon his wife, Nina Hartley, mm-hmm. you know, getting screwed in the driveway yeah. at the party. Yeah, I know the scene you're talking about. Go, like, you're, you're embarrassing me. <laughs> Go away, Bill. Yeah. It's like, yeah, Bill, fuck off. You're I'm embarrassing her. My, my wife has an ass in her cock in the driveway, Kirk. I'm sorry, I can't talk. Is I, that in the script, by the way? I didn't I didn't go over the script today. I don't know. I'm, I don't I'm know, very but... curious if he just fucked up that line and they were like, yeah, hey, leave it in. Oh, That's man. Great. She's got an ass in her cock. There's, there's just, it's so funny. The whole movie just has so much of that. And there's so much heart in it, you know, uh, there, there's tenderness in it. There's, you know, horror in it and tragedy in it. And it's, you know, it's really sad in so many different ways. But as a whole, it just, it all works. And one of the reasons why it works so well is the soundtrack, obviously. I mean, this is a, this is a soundtrack movie. Without and, a doubt, two volumes, yeah. Yeah, two volumes. And it, and it came out at a time when, you know, the soundtrack was actually an ancillary sort of profit motive, right? In mm-hmm. terms of getting a movie made. You had, uh, you know, uh, Pulp Fiction, obviously, with the huge success of its soundtrack, which um, the music supervisor of Pulp Fiction, Karen Rockman, also was the music supervisor on Boogie Nights. Oh, yeah, yeah. I've heard her name. Mm-hmm. But there's something to uh, the way that pop music was used in movies during this period that set the period apart on the one hand and kind of launched people like Wes Anderson, who has a you know really uh, great use of music in the movie, but Boogie Night still stands alone in the way that it uses music to me because it is so deeply woven into the scenes. I'm thinking about Lonely Boy with uh, Amber Waves at the party when when the song lo- when they're they're looking the, her son calls. Yeah, no, absolutely. Yeah, yeah there's yeah. that. I mean, even uh, all the way from the beginning, right uh, from the from the opening of you know for the best of my love or whatever. Um, uh, all the way through to that Jungle Fever song where uh, he's in the bed with uh, Cheryl Ann, you know, I'm, I'm, I'm going to be a star, you know, a big, bright, shining star. Uh, and doom, doom, ch- doom, doom, ch- and it goes into so the uh, to the nightclubs, back to the nightclub where yeah. Roller Girl gets the instructions to go actually uh, check out the package. Yeah. Uh, and as she rolls up to the dishwashing room, right, and that skate kicks up yeah, right in the break up. of that song. Yeah. Uh, yeah. I get so excited thinking about that soundtrack, even with no real affinity towards 70s music or the period. Yeah, me neither. And I'm not, most of the music that's in this film, I, I'm not necessarily a fan of outs, but every time I hear it, I want to, I want, I just, I finish the song and it always reminds me, I, I cannot separate those songs from the movie. It always reminds me of the movie, every time. Hey, Reed! Rito! I want you to meet the new boy on the street. Eddie Adams. Hi, I'm Eddie. Hi, Eddie. Reed Rothschild. I want you to stick around for a while, okay? Sure. 
Make himself special. So you live on the street? No, no. Oh, I thought Jack just said you did. Something interesting to me about the soundtrack, too, is how really on the nose it is. It doesn't feel on the nose when you're watching it, but uh, but lyrically, it, it speaks directly to whatever's going on, right? Jesse's girl. Well, totally. We'll get, well, yeah, yeah, even before that, I'm thinking of um, after he has the fallout with his mom, right, and the big sort of blow up, and he, he leaves the house, and he goes he goes to Jack Corner's house, and the song's playing, his mama told me not to come, right? Right. So, okay, boom, right there on that. Then when he's with uh, Roller Girl, uh, at Jack's house, and they and they have sex on the couch. She's playing brand new key. Where I got a brand new yeah. pair of roller skates. You got a brand new key. Yeah, and, it's, and I wonder what his key is, right? Yeah, no, I actually, <laughs> I went deep on this shit because I've seen this movie a million times. So I didn't feel like I needed to watch the movie again to prepare for this conversation, but I did just start digging into songs, and you know how it is with Wikipedia. And uh, Melanie, who <coughs> wrote the song and recorded it, she still lives here in Nashville. She's like in her sixties or something. But um, yeah, I found an interview with her talking about that. And she's like, yeah, the lyrics don't really quite make sense. But the key thing is definitely a sexual innuendo. Yeah. Oh, for sure. Easily. It, yeah, obviously. It, and, and perfect for, for that scene, you know, where she's finding finding his key for the sure. first time. Uh, another one is um, uh, when Philip Seymour Hoffman shows up to the party and it's playing um, uh, uh, You Sexy Thing. Right. right. Yeah. And, and he, he zeroes in. <laughs> the, the camera does that. Uh, what, what's it called? What, what's iris the deal? in the it's iris like, in yeah the iris in uh, all of which you know we can't talk about boogie nights like all this soundtrack stuff obviously uh, is inspired by the great work of Martin Scorsese right I mean his use of, of of pop music throughout his whole career basically sets the stage for that kind of uh, hyper real energy that these things bring. And so much of Boogie Nights is on the shoulders of Martin Scorsese all the way down to all of the sort of camera techniques that, granted, you know, uh, Paul will uh, refer back to uh, French filmmakers like Max Ophels and people who were doing a lot of kinetic camera work way back when, and that that's ultimately what Scorsese was drawing from in terms of his camera movements. But from an editing perspective, all you have to do is really watch Goodfellas and Casino and every photographic, you know, camera trick in the book is contained in those two movies that he just picks up and applies to his world, right? Sure, but he, he makes it a little more show-offy than, than I think Scorsese does, which is fine. Uh, th- that opening sequence is much celebrated. Uh, the sequence from Boogie Nights is what I'm talking about, of course, uh, with good reason. Yeah. It's, it's, it's fucking amazing. There's a lot of moving parts going on there. I'm, I'm, I, w- I wonder how many times they, they ran through that. I, they, I think they did it in seven takes. They ran seven takes for that. Yeah, I believe uh, it. And they had a secondary Steadicam operator on, on hand because they didn't know how many they were going to have to do. Uh, but to the point of, yeah, uh, that opening shot both uh, being a uh, sort of one-upmanship to the Copa scene mm-hmm. in Goodfellas, the long steady shot into the Copacabana, uh, the intent to try to one-up that. I'm not sure if it's longer or whatever, but I did see where Burt Reynolds was not really enthused by – any, or he wasn't really sold on any of Paul's excitement around no. how cool these shots were. He's like, all this stuff's been done before. He's just like, again, that this punk kid thinks he's onto something, but he's doing all the same stuff that we've seen before. Yeah, I guess we can touch base on that just a little bit. We don't want to dwell too much on it, but Burt Reynolds was a confused old man when he made this movie, apparently. He did not get it. He didn't really care much for Paul Thomas Anderson by most reports. And uh, there was a really tension-filled three days on set. Uh, I think Mark. Wahlberg oh, they came to blows. Thing. Yeah, that. Yeah, and I think did he go to his grave, kind of, still not getting it. Yeah, or did yeah. He yeah. Ever? I mean, he won a Golden Globe for his role in it, and I think he's still. I, I, I heard an interview with him when he was an elderly, elderly man. I mean, it was just recorded a year or two ago where he said he still hadn't seen the movie all the way through. Yeah, he wrote it for him, I think, with him in mind anyway, and he turned it down, and they floated a few other names. Nicholson, I think, was Warren Beatty, or am I making that up? See, we should make this a whole section of this conversation because uh, the fantasy casting of what could have been right. is, such a, is such a— DiCaprio uh, a, as Dirk Diggler. Uh. <laughs> DiCaprio, well, and they also offered it to Joaquin Phoenix— no, oh, I didn't know that. But his brother, I think, had just, he just passed, and okay. uh, that didn't work out. But yeah, Leo was his first choice. 
he went off to do to Titanic. People variously think that uh, he was too afraid of the material. Sure. And it wasn't so That's much. That's understandable. Yeah. I, I mean, get it. I mean, you don't know that Paul Thomas Anderson is an unknown quantity at this point. He's only made one movie at this point, and no one saw it. So, and then you take a look at this gigantic script. It's like 300 pages or something, and it's just full of dicks and tits. Yeah, it, it's 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 no wonder that then some people were kind of prudish about it. it. It wouldn't surprise me in the least bit. I know Burt Reynolds was prudish about it, and he had some of the most explicit uh, language and lines in the in the film. I mean, stuff. I'm I'm not even going to repeat here, and this is a podcast. I mean, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> well, yeah, and and um. In the lead up to getting Boogie Nights made, I mean, yeah, there was this, there was the the excitement or you know kind of rumblings around the script and this you know kind of hot script and this hot property and this kid who was uh, being spoken of very highly around the film festival circuit, right? So the Hard Eight, uh, while little seen, actually word did travel in terms of the quality of it, and so through all those sort of back channel Hollywood things, um, that is what kind of gave it the momentum. That it did there, uh, both in dealing with kind of uncharted territory in terms of a feature length movie, right? A Hollywood movie dealing with the porn industry. Uh, I, you know, it, it is on the heels of, or it came around the same time of like the People versus Larry Flint, right? You've got pornography uh, kind of slightly, you know, entering into the thing. So it's almost like a, like a deep impact and Armageddon kind of scenario, right? Sure. Where these, these properties, you know, they find their way in tandem to production, but this one had the word on the street of this hot new director that was doing good stuff with this crazy graphic, uh, but really good script. You know, people were talking about it's the best script I've ever read. And from a production standpoint, in terms of time and place, again, uh, Michael DeLuca of New Line Cinema, he had passed on Wes Anderson. He had passed on kids. I think they had passed on Pulp Fiction as well. So he was kind of looking for that hot young director. They just had a couple of successes with uh, Seven and like Dumb and Dumber, right? So mm-hmm. they had uh, they, they were kind of flush with cash in a way and were willing to risk the production on, on this kind of graphic thing. It's going to be a three-hour. Their only two stipulations was, all right, it's got to be less than three hours and it's got to be rated R, right? Right, and, and, and PTA wanted NC-17 three hours plus, I think. Yeah, know. so you've got PTA who coming off of the Reicher sort of uh, debacle, absolutely, you know, militant around what this movie is going to be. And he's trying to be as explicit as possible up front, going so far as to, you know, in the first on the first page of the script saying this movie will be shot with anamorphic lenses. Right. right? He was intent on shooting 235 to one. It was going to be three hours long. He's got this 300 page script. We're going to shoot it all. Uh, and uh, it's going to be NC-17, blah, blah, blah. He was probably setting himself up to make greater demands in the front end, knowing that he was going to ultimately relent in one way or another. You, right. know, you always got to anchor it on some big ask, ask in terms of the negotiations. More, ask for way more than you actually want. And in the end, they he, he decided, okay, we'll cut it back and make it R, but it's still going to be three hours. And then when he delivered a movie that was like 20 minutes short of three hours, the, the, the studio was just super happy with that. Yeah, yeah, and there's a lot of material that's cut out. Fantastic scenes. So yeah. tell me some of those scenes, because it's been a while since I've uh, visited the deleted scenes on that disc. There's a second award ceremony where uh, it's like the second year that Dirk is just sweeping the uh, the adult film industry awards, their, their Grammys, or Oscars, rather. And uh, in the final film, he just stands up there, and he looks bored, and he just kind of says, thanks, or thank you, and that's it. And then it cuts away. Um, they show reaction shots from pretty much everyone that's there. And you get little, you just get little silent, almost character moments with a lot of those guys. And it's just fun. In fact, Little Bill's wife is, Little Bill is all excited and he's clapping. And Little Bill's wife is just like, I fucking some dude that's right off camera winking at him. You know, just little stuff like that. Um, then we get uh, extra roller girl nudity. We, uh, which I'm glad this scene got cut, though. It's the scene where Louis Guzman, you remember he's begging Amber to talk Jack into letting him into the movies, and I think it works better the way they actually did it in the film because you see him, it's sort of is like a silent joke when you see them shooting a film and he's playing the bartender, mm-hmm. and you kind of go, oh, look, he let him into the movie, but he's not performing. In the deleted scene, he's about to perform. He's, he's about to have sex with somebody. And he's in this room with Roller Girl, who's changing, so there's just Heather Graham boobs everywhere. And 
he's really nervous because he's got a, he admits that he's got a very tiny dick. And, and, and she's trying to console him, like, oh, that can't be that. And he's like, no, no, it's, it's really little, Roller Girl. So there's a lot of that. There's a lot of fun character stuff like that. And then there's, of course, the um, cocaine improv. You've got Todd, Reed, and Dirk all doing tons of blow off of a, uh, a clear glass coffee table, and the camera is under the coffee table moving back and forth, and they're just jabbering. It's just coke jabber. And it's just, it's, it's, a, it's manic, but it's a lot of fun. Yeah, he writes great coke-addled characters, I think because he did a lot of cocaine himself. Yeah, he admitted that in a, some interview that I just read, as a matter of fact, today. Like, oh, you've got such a great ear for that, that cocaine babble. How'd you do it? And he's like, well, I used to do a bunch of cocaine. Fun now. It's just go and go and go. It's, it's over. It's too many things. Too many things. Too many things. Too many things. Okay. Let's go walk. I don't want to leave this room. Me either. Honey, I love you, Mom. I guess we should unpack what the movie is, I uh, guess. Fuck no. Golden age of porn, late 70s. It covers about seven, eight years. No, goes into we don't like need to do that. Yeah, it's we a don't bunch need of to stuff. do that. People, look, if you don't know what Boogie Nights is, just take our advice. Uh, go rent it right now. Watch it. Block off three hours of your time. Don't tell your parents that you're watching it. And you're going to have a blast. It's one of the funnest movies uh, and one of the best roller coaster rides uh, if you just give yourself over to it. Um, yeah, it's like a ride. It's so much fun. It is It is so much fucking fun. Probably my favorite movie. Lots of big fun being had in the movie, but there are still these undertones that are going on uh, that kind of remain through, you know, as a staple of his stuff. And with this being his second movie in which it's, you know, it's, a, it's like a cannonball explosion of a career, right, in terms of just trying, trying to throw everything into this. Um, but still yielding the same kind of uh, uh, the same kind of considerations. The same things are on his mind around um, the, the the need for family. You know, all of these people are looking for some sense of uh, of, of place in the world, and they are being accepted into this small knit kind of group that becomes this extended family and this surrogate family unit. Uh, that supports them, right? It supports them both economically as well as emotionally and with their drug habits as well. So you've got that component of it going on. You've got, again, the, 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 that notion I talked about last time of uh, self-reinvention, I mean, and the multiple layers of identity in this movie where, you know, you've got Eddie Adams who completely just throws his whole past uh, away and reinvents himself as Dirk Diggler on the one hand, but then you take it one layer, you know, above that uh, into this meta uh, sort of media world, this movie world of Brock Landers, right? Right. Um, and that goes the same for all of the characters, Amber Waves, who's Maggie, uh, and her, you know, how, mm-hmm. these, how these paths that kind of uh, reach out from a, a, and, and puncture their current worlds, right, uh, at the party whenever the sun calls, looking, is there a Maggie here? Maggie? Maggie, right? Right. That's a, it's a, it's a gosh, that just, it's a tinge of, of pain knowing that she had just tried to be on the phone with her son, and uh, gosh, there's that dangling thread of an old life that she's still trying to grab hold of in some way, as, as, as Amber Wave's character anyway. Um, she's since sort of completely reinvented herself as the mother figure explicitly, yeah, as stated absolutely. by, by, by uh, Jack Horner. And, A mother to all those who need love. And refers to Dirk, you know, throughout explicitly as, you know, my baby boy, my baby you know, boy, my little yeah. boy, et cetera. Then with uh, with Roller Girl, man. I mean, in the scene where it's the uh, on the prowl oh, scene that's in the limo, so hard to watch. And the kid she does from, such a great job. Oh, uh, it's heartbreaking when the guy recognizes her. Yeah, and says her real name and that look on her face. Oh, Which what was her Jesus. real name? Brandy. Brandy. Yeah, you yeah. Brandy, right? You yeah. remember me? Um, that was the same guy doing the the pantomiming the blowjob at the beginning of the movie. But 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 therein is that 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 re, that self-reinvention, that sort of escaping of a previous life which uh, is done in, through through the movies in this sense, right? So it's a marriage of uh, not only what is this kind of preoccupation and maybe it's not so much a preoccupation of, you know, self-reinvention as it is just knowing that people often want to escape some aspect of their past um, and need to take control of it in some new way, married to his love of film. And his love of media, right? So there's almost this fetishistic 
view of media and the mediums and the tools and the cameras, uh, you know, insofar as like even on the first day of the set, you know, going into the camera while filming yeah, Amber and into, Dirk's yeah. first sex scene. That's a great shot. I love it. It is a great it's shot. Just two cameras pointed at each other, really, but it's wonderful. And it does a great job of desexualizing the scene. Like, yeah, I love the, the fact that despite this movie, a lot of people think this movie is about porn. It's not about porn. I mean, it's a tired old cliche. The movie's not about porn. It's about family. That's all true. But uh, it takes place in that world. That's, that's the setting, and it's all treated completely mundane. There's nothing remotely sexy about any of the scenes that deal with that. It's all treated as the only person that really gets like uh, heated about that stuff is Little Bill. I guess, but that's... How the sex is treated in the movie is interesting because it's exactly the kind of magic trick that he has to pull in making this studio movie that can be or has the possibility of being so graphic and so, you know, sort of abrasive to an audience, right? He's got all these likable characters, and yes, they are going to have sex with one another in one form or another. Or they're going to be nude, but there's never a, an overt sense of sexuality to it, and there are, I think... Uh, specific filmic techniques that he does, such as in that case, in that first scene, right? It's the first real sex scene beyond the... Uh, uh, the audition. The audition yeah. scene, of which we can speak to that too. I mean, when she lays down on top of him, you know, we cut to Jack Horner, and it's that's where it establishes him as the voyeur watching them and us as the audience, effectively through his eyes, becoming a voyeur, establishing us as that voyeur. And and it and it removes us, right? It just it it, cre- it makes us the observer. Then in that first sex scene with Amber and Dirk, uh, going into the camera is one tactic by which it is to remove you from any of the sense of sexuality. It's all the mechanics. It's the mechanics of not only uh, the film and the way that the that, that the camera works. It's the fetishizing of just film and those mechanics in and of themselves because he loves all of that stuff. But when you do actually cut into the scene, right, you're either mediated through the camera itself, through the faraway mm-hmm. viewfinder, or you are seeing the actual inset of a 16 millimeter film reel of this. And it's only whenever you cut into the scene itself, back to 35 millimeter, you're in that kind of, um, you know, that handheld kind of right on top of them, really kind of uncomfortable close ups that uh, is in no way, you know, about, again, sensuality. In that scene, it's really about Amber bringing him in, right? She's getting closer to him, both as that mother figure, and she, it's it's kind of, it's really weird how maternal she is in that sex scene, where she's like, "Are you okay? Are you you're doing great, honey. Yeah. You're doing great." Like yeah. like you would be saying it to you know your child who just did their sort of school performance, you know? Yeah, I think she even throws a look towards one of the other people when he says something that's completely naive, like you know, we can just go right into the sex. You know, you guys can just go right into the sex, and he's like, "Well, if that's okay with you, Amber." And and she just has this look on her face, like, oh, "He's so sweet. He's so sweet. Oh, that's like, sweet." She's just, like, "Yeah, that'll that'll be just fine." Yeah, yeah. J- just come on my tits. Come, come on my stomach. <laughs> if you, it's if so you can. fucking weird. If you can. If you can, just just come on my stomach. It works in the tits. movie, folks. I know it sounds fucked up, but... Do you want to practice your lines with me? No, I know. You look great, honey. Thanks. Um, does he want me to keep going until I come? Yeah, you just come when you're ready. Where should I do it? Where do you want? Wherever you tell me. Well, come on my tits if you can, okay? Just pull it out and do it on my stomach and my tits if you can. Yeah, no problem. It's a job, right? It's a yeah, job it's for mundane. everybody. It's, it's mundane for these folks. There's a lot of standing around when they have to reload the mag, and it's just, you know, them standing there. And, it, yeah, it's just it's very mundane, just boring stuff. And I, I'm, I'm glad that the movie doesn't make me feel like a creep when I watch it. It could have. A lesser filmmaker would have just put tits all over the place, and it would have been just the most explicit thing ever. But uh, I don't feel creepy watching these people have sex with each other. Which is always a good thing. <laughs> Let's talk about the cast. Big old ensemble cast. This movie uh, differs from his first film, Heart 8, in, uh, that only had about four characters in it. This one is an ensemble. There's about 15 main characters, I suppose, something like that. They pretty much all get arcs. 
Um, at least in the deleted scenes, you get the ends of some of those arcs. But most of them, most of them get arcs. Most of them have a uh, finished stories. With the uh, with that cast, some of them were written for you know his stable of actors. Sure. The Philip Seymour Hoffman character of Scotty was was written for him. The Philip Baker Hall, obviously John C. Riley, that whole group, and uh, to see John C. Riley in this movie again just. It's the first opportunity we can see the comedic chops of John C. Riley. Yeah, I think a lot of younger people just see him as that guy that does a movie with Will Ferrell every now and again, and they see him in these, you know, I'm, I'm not trying to shit talk those movies, but I mean, you know, whatever. They're they are what they are. They're, they're they're fine for what they are, but they don't really swing for the fences in the way that a movie like Boogie Nights does. And he is just hilarious in this movie. The first time we see Reed when he's making margaritas and he has no idea what he's doing and he's that whole conversation about, uh, you know, how much do you lift, how much do you squat? And that, that whole thing. And, you know, have you cool, seen, cool. seen that movie uh, Star Wars? Yeah. People say I look like Han Solo. Hmm. Yeah, I know. It's so great. Really? Yeah. <laughs> and and really, it sets up the dynamic between them because they kind of become this dynamic duo, right? Through yeah. you know Dirk Diggler and Chess Rockwell and Brock Landers and uh, what's Reed Rothschild. Reed Rothschild. But even in that first meeting, it's like two adolescent boys, right? I mean, they're just kind of riffing on you know uh, pop culture and that kind of early competitiveness, right? So he's the new boy on the street, and Reed Rothschild, he's seen this before, right? So yeah. he's like, yeah, I'm going to kind of feel you out, you know? This you ever is... work out at that gym, you know, Gold's Gym? He's like, oh, never, I, I'd have seen you there, right? <laughs> it's like these little nags or whatever. Yeah. Uh, and then it's fun to see the uh, the power dynamic shift because as Dirk, you know, sort of ascends his stardom, uh, you know, Chest become, or Reed becomes sort of secondary, and he's wanting to support him and Maybe he's the entry. Uh, he's the way. sidekick. He's yeah. the, he becomes that sidekick in a sure. way. Uh, sure. The other thing about so many of the characters in this in this movie, uh, them in particular, is how endearingly dumb they are. <laughs> yeah. Uh, one thing you'll notice when going through Paul Thomas Anderson's films is that he kind of has an impartial camera. He doesn't really judge the characters too much as a director. Uh, he just sort of lets you figure it out. You know. The movie doesn't come right out and just celebrate porn culture, but it doesn't also explicitly say this is just depraved either. It just sort of shows what is and just leaves it up to the audience to decide whether or not how they feel about it. Also, that he uh, infuses it with so much humor throughout, right, yeah. is, is what also disarms you and kind of you know really draws you into these people because they're saying a lot of stupid stuff <laughs> throughout the whole thing. <laughs> uh, but yeah. it humanizes them in a way that... Um, Speed it up a few octaves. You heard it. Speed it up a few octaves. Yeah. These, these, are the ones. these are great. Yeah, those are really cool. Are they lizard? No, they're Italian. I'm gonna fucking buy these. Two dollars, right? My car, right? That is incredible. But does it make you nervous when you're dealing with all those evil forces? Horses? What? No, the evil forces. Evil? No, man. It's not evil. It's an illusion. Yeah, it's, yeah, it's confusing. Thank you. He's obviously a great writer, and it's one of the things that uh, that positioned him in order to be a filmmaker, to do what he wanted to do. Is that he knew from the beginning that uh, you know there's a dearth of material out there. I'm going to write. I'm going to write what I what I make, and that's going to make me uh, valuable, and it's what's going to give me leverage in terms of being able to make the movies I want to make. I'm going to write something that people want. Right, create the demand just in that. You can see even throughout the rest of his career and the rest of his life with his uh, kind of low culture. Uh, loves and high culture loves. He just kind of runs the gamut, as I was saying earlier, um, going on into his love of Adam Sandler movies, you know, which leads to Punch Drunk Love. Baffles me completely. That just baffles me. I, I, he, I've and never I, heard PTA say a bad word about another movie or actor, though. So no, I think he ultimately real, he 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 recognizes that making movies is hard. And uh, uh, what was the uh, the anecdote recently with um, John Krasinski? Right. Oh yeah, John Krasinski apparently uh, just had. Something not negative, something negative to say about a, a movie that had just recently come out, and uh, he said that Paul Thomas Anderson sort of pulled him aside, said, "Hey, eh, don't do that." You know, a, a lot of good work went into making that shitty movie. You know, a lot of people did a lot of great work, and so the movie didn't work. You know, it's it's not necessarily those people's fault. And it's exactly that kind of uh, sensibility that he approaches Boogie Nights with in terms of the filmmaking that. 
Jack Horner is doing and that whole team. I mean, they're so invested in it. They're, everybody is so invested in their creative pursuits, no matter what it is. And they're, they're, it's kind of funnily and tragically like bad on the one hand, but it's given the same level of respect that any good work would do. It's like no matter what the outcome is, the, uh, the act of doing it is what's important. And that kind of extended family that emerges when a group of people set out to create something, right, mm-hmm. for good, however it turns out. Uh, it's that world that obviously he was looking to create for himself as a filmmaker and the group of people that he surrounded himself with throughout his whole career and his actors, et cetera. I think that it's a respect to the art of filmmaking that he affords even the lowliest of filmmakers uh, in the porn industry. Sure. Angels that live in respect. my town. That's the, the citizen cane of pornography, apparently, in the, the Paul Thomas Anderson world. You know, It, it was... Jack's vision, his idea to make a film that was true and right and dramatic, and he did it, you know? He, he finally made it. Well, I mean, I don't know about all that. Uh, and, and, you know, you can't go without saying that— Well, he rec- thinks he did, yeah. Well, Tarantino recently came out saying that that was one of his only beefs with Boogie Nights was the fact that, you know, this filmmaker who he was saying— uh, the filmmaker who he was based off of, uh, uh, an Italian name that I can't remember right now, uh, would never have seen his work as thinking. He would have known that it is bad, right? He wouldn't have thought that it was uh, good the way that Jack Horner did, which I, I just think Tarantino should shut the fuck up. You know, he's trying to uh, map his own expectations onto the movie in a way that's unfair. And it's exactly the self-belief that Jack Horner has in terms of realizing his own dreams through this new work that was the impetus of Dirk Diggler, right? And like, this is the opportunity. That's what binds them together, right? It's one of the things that when the prodigal son returns towards the end, that gives him that entry point to Jack. You know, I mean, they had a, they have, they, things eventually blow up in a coke addled, you know, flaccid rage. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. And uh, and he goes off into uncharted territories. Right. And that's sort of where the uh, in the 80s, which we, we really should break this up into two parts where we talk about the 70s side of this, because that is one part of the movie. Everything's up on the up. And then the 80s part of the movie when everything's on the down. Right. Yeah. It's that. All right. It's all fun and games until somebody gets hurt here are the consequences of all these life decisions that we've made, right? And so the first part being so fun and so much energy uh, and all leading up to the New Year's Eve party where, uh, again, great music choice with um, uh, the song that Little Bill is going into the, uh, into the house with and then coming back out and finding his wife uh, and ultimately committing suicide – it's double a, murder, suicide. You know. Double murder and suicide. It's like boom, and then smash cut to the '80s. It's uh, it's 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 funny to think of it in terms of that uh, that political transition from the me generation of the '70s, right? Kind of coming off the uh, uh, the late '60s and the whole hippie and peace and love, and now we become a very sort of narcissistic and self-serving 70s uh, kind of culture wherein it's disco and having a good time and just blowing it all off and blowing off steam and doing lots of drugs, of which, you know, they're the fun kind of drugs, you know, the more laid back drugs, a lot of pot and quaaludes. And then the cocaine uh, the years, cocaine years kind of yeah. come in. And now we're off into, uh, you know, a conservative Reaganite 80s where the, the fallout of, um, of that generational sort of shift is, is hinged on film to video. There's, this, there's the mythologized and uh, fetishized film, you know, of Jack Horner's and cinema yeah. Yeah. as meaningful. And it's at that party where you have Philip Baker Hall show up, uh, Floyd Gondoli. Uh, he's there to uh, tout the next generation. And he's got this, he's got the, the young sort of amateur actors. It's a whole new yeah. kind, of, kind of thing. And now uh, the, the world is, has, is changing and now everybody has to adapt to it. And it's all about capitalism. You know, he's the money guy. You've got the colonel there who's been putting up the money, but ultimately there's one layer above him, right, where Floyd Gondoli's got his own... Uh, sort of angle out in the world, he might actually be one of the funders of the colonel's operations, right? And now that uh, that he's finding the distribution network on video and he sees that he can make more money with less uh, investment, uh, that's naturally what's going to happen. It's what we actually see happening today. It's, it's kind of funny that uh, that Paul Thomas Anderson, you know, is really 
holding out the uh, the old guard ranks along with Tarantino and Christopher Nolan for mm. you know the power of film, you know the majesty of film still being something as a medium to hold on to rather than embrace what is you know a very good video today, but nonetheless it loses some power, and it's exactly that power that he had right you know early on uh, in Boogie Nights. This is the future. Videotape tells the truth. Wait a minute. You come into my house, my party, to tell me about the future. That the future is tape, videotape, and not film. It is amateurs and not professionals. I'm a filmmaker. That's why I will never make a movie on videotape. In that New Year's Eve party is the turning point of the movie, and it's the turning point for uh, so many of the characters. Dirk gets introduced to cocaine, right, through Julian Moore at that point. Uh, the uh, Scotty character who has manifest his uh, adulation and sort of obsession with Dirk and buying the car, right? And that oh, whole sad... So cringy and sad. Oh, but yet I'm another... Yeah. Oh, but that is such... In so, in so little time, Philip Seymour Hoffman is able to sort of inject so much humanity into that. We've all been in that situation. Uh, when Philip Baker Hall comes in, there's that song playing, another kind of on point with... Um, uh, driver's seat, where Floyd's essentially getting into the driver's seat of uh, of Jack's whole filmmaking operation, and with the Colonel b- later, uh, as we begin our descent, uh, you know he's got a little predilection for young girls, and yeah, and that is probably the worst thing done by anybody in the movie, and it's he who has the biggest comeuppance. You know, we talked about last time. You know, Paul having a, 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 a clear sense of morality and uh, a, a clear sense of I'm going to get payback on a particular character, depending on how reprehensible the behavior is. To your point, he's non-judgmental. I mean, as a, as a writer and as a director, he's non-judgmental towards these characters for the, f- across the majority of them. But there's always that one character who crosses the line, who goes too far. And the colonel is definitely that in this. Yeah. And he, while everybody else has a relatively small arc. They go to dark places. They are able to emerge out of it. Um, There is a relatively happy ending for most of them, but it's good to see the colonel in prison being completely bludgeoned, you know, bloodied nose. Being slapped around and crying. Yeah, that's the one instance of, I think, his... His clear sense of retribution sure. showing up in the movie. This is a fine life you've made for yourself. You really should be proud. I mean, really. Yeah, fuck you. Your fucking film suck now anyway. The Colonel has his retribution, but uh, but Dirk and Roller Girl. Uh, especially, and Jack in his moment of having just kind of fallen to the bottom of uh, not wanting to do video, not wanting to, I mean, he's had to, he's had to reinvent himself in the face of this video stuff. And um, it's in that Clementine's loop period, right? Right. With, uh, with Roller Girl in the, in the limousine with the guy that we were talking about. Um, Therein too is retribution, right? But it's not so much retribution against them as it is like, the confrontation with oneself of how far you have fallen. Yeah, they beat the shit out of that guy, but it's not about... It's their low point, though. Even mm-hmm. though they're the ones administering this this vicious uh, beating, it's their low point. And that character was just used to highlight what these guys were really uptight about, like, say, Roller Girl being outed as Brandy and that that whole discomfort with that. And the thing that makes Jack snap is when he says, your films suck anyway, and he walks out, and that's when Jack's just fucking had it. Which, that in that moment, is the only time in Boogie Nights that I, just to kind of harken back to my, my truck theory, uh, there's only one truck in Boogie Nights, and it happens when Roller Girl is coming out of the uh, uh, limousine up to just bludgeon the guy with the roller skates. But it's not a full 18-wheeler. It's one of those half kind of, uh, you know, delivery trucks. But it yeah. whooshes through in the background as she's on her way. So she, too, had made a huh. definite decision to go and beat the shit out of that guy. And then with Dirk over in his world, right, where the guy picks him up in the, in the pickup truck, and he goes and he, you know, unable to get it up. And he's just, you know, he's at his low point. He's back to turning tricks, which apparently John Holmes— uh, did as well. So a lot of all of Dirk's 
trajectory mirrors a lot of the actual John Holmes world as well, because this is all also going up to, all right, he's kind of fallen on hard times. He's been cast out from the family, right? He's out in the wilderness. Uh, he's exposed. And it's in that moment when he's taken advantage of by this guy, when really, I think it's like three brothers in a pickup truck drive up out of nowhere and beat the shit out of him. Yeah. Wait a minute. That that also recurs in Punch Drunk Love. <laughs> yeah. Which is kind of an interesting thing. I, I, when I was watching it again recently, just thinking about, all right, three brothers, pickup truck, pulling up fast, trying to incite violence, et cetera. It's funny. Um, means nothing ultimately, but it's just curious. Sure. And it's right after that where we get the biggest instance of chance that plays out in the movie, right? Which Buck. we talked about previously. Mm-hmm. Uh, yeah, it's where, all right, that truck, those, those two trucks peel out into the uh, into the traffic, and then here comes the limousine passing by as the camera pans all in one shot, and then it picks up Buck's uh, car going all you know going back the other direction and stops at the uh, the donut shop. Yeah, Buck and his very pregnant wife stop at a donut shop. Buck goes in, starts picking stuff out. Uh, the place gets held up, and things go horribly awry. But this is really the point which the low point starts to rise up again because something god awful happens in that donut shop when the the uh, the robbery goes sideways but it works out in a way that's very good for buck yeah you're right that is the one little glimmer of hope that buck has because he's been turned down from his bank loan because he wants to open up the hi-fi store and he and his wife jesse saint vincent played by melora walters uh who again from the last scene of heart eight mm-hmm and then on into your beloved coke addle character in Magnolia, uh, they represent two great people who ultimately are able to get out of the game, um, not unlike Becky and Jerome in our canon view of it. Right. Um, or that deleted scene never happened. So it's great to see them uh, on their you know still treacherous but potentially positive path, whereas now we're at the pit of the belly, right, with Jack and Roller Girl and with Dirk. And it's Dirk who's only going to go farther, right? It's right. One last thing, long way down. Hey, hey, Rahab! Oh, friends! Which one is Tom? The climax of the movie is one of the most iconic set pieces. Uh, and all of cinema, from my perspective, you yeah, know, it's like, yeah, that's not an exaggeration. Yeah, it that, is. That, that's that's pretty much true. It, it continues. It continues not only with the uh, with the excellent music choice uh, that has been on display throughout the whole movie, right, and how it kind of ties into the moment. But uh, but yeah, it's 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 also in, influenced by a John Holmes scenario related to the Wonderland murders, right which I don't know all the details on, and it's not really that important other than it's a, it's a, it's a jumping-off point for PTA uh, in terms of Alfred Molina's character being a drug dealer and Todd Parker and Reed and— Fucking Todd. We've gone through this whole podcast, and we really haven't talked about Todd, uh, played get, by get, the wonderful Thomas Jane in this— God damn, I love Todd. He's such a fucking lunatic. He's so fun to watch. Just him talking about what's under the hood is just the shit. I could watch that. I could watch Todd all day. In the master bedroom, under the bed, in a floor safe. You can understand. What the fuck is the matter with you, Todd? Let's go. Todd, come on, man. Shut up, Dirk. I told you I got a plan. I got a very good plan. It's manic. It it puts you on edge. Every actor, and they say the crew member was on edge every time... Cosmo lit a firecracker and it popped. Everybody in the room would jump, with the exception of Alfred Molina's character because he had an earwig in his ear and he was listening to that uh, Night Ranger song. So he really wasn't even hearing it, which is perfect because that guy shouldn't be jumping. He should be the one guy in the room not not affected by these uh, firecrackers. So I guess him and his bodyguard. Yeah, well, it, the, the tension that is built up just by the chaos that he represents, you know, and just kind of going around smoking crack or whatever he's doing, freebasing. Freebasing. You want to play baseball? Yeah. Yeah, I want to play yeah. baseball. Uh, the Russian roulette thing, right, where he pulls the Holy gun out. Oh, shit, yeah. All while referring to 
the music playing, and he likes to make all the mixtapes. I hate that, you know, when they put the songs in a certain order. I hate that. I hate that. You know, um, it, the the use of music within this scene is just off the charts. With Sister Christian in the first part of it, going into Jesse's Girl, uh, and that whole uh, section of Jesse's Girl that hangs on Mark Wahlberg. Right? There's like a 50 second, almost minute long. It's great. He just spaces out, gets that thousand yard stare. Yeah, and uh, I mean, it's, it's a stroke of brilliance and and balls that they they held on that, and it's all going under the, um, you know, the lyric of you know you play along with the charade, yeah. you know, you don't think that you can change anymore, and all of that's processing while, uh, you know, this this thing's just about to go, you know, full tilt boogie, it's going to go off the rails. Wait a minute, if I stay here any longer. Uh, I'm gonna die, you know, and it's like all of that weight with the chaos of, of Rahad Jackson going on and the firecrackers going on, of which even during that the period, the uh, the firecrackers go away, and it's like what really allows for you to kind of hang on that look of his, um, which you know for it being Marky Mark's you know kind of breakout role, he had done the Basketball Diaries before that as a serious thing. Mm-hmm. Uh, I think a lot can be said about the performance of Mark Wahlberg in this movie and. That particular shot in and of itself, I mean, that kind of self-detachment, which was so perfect for that moment, coupled with the, with the music that's going on, uh, all then to, all right, suddenly standing up, got to get out of there. And that's when old Todd decides to uh, reveal the second part of his plan. That he didn't bother telling his buddies about. Yeah, yeah, God damn. <laughs> I want what's in the motherfucking safe. <laughs> Come on, you can do it. How does he say it? Uh, oh, God. I got a plan. I got a plan. I got a good plan. He says he wants what's in the motherfucking safe under the motherfucking bed in the motherfucking master bedroom. And uh, <sighs> Molino's reaction is great, too, because he's still smiling. And he's like, what? What's he talking about? What are you talking about? He doesn't give a shit. He's like, yeah, come on, smoke some coke with me. Yeah, and it devolves from there. Uh, you know, the gun's out, and the bodyguards get shot. And again, a great shift in music because the uh, you know Jesse's girl ends right as the bo- the bodyguard who's been shot hits the ground. It's a perfect alignment of uh, of music to action within a shot. And 99 Left Balloons comes on, and then right as uh, the song really sets off, he gets you know, shot in the stomach with a shotgun. Yeah. And a dun 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 all while they're scurrying out the door. It's a juxtaposition. Those three songs that play during this entire sequence from My Awesome Mixtape number six, they're so upbeat and happy, and the juxtaposition about that to what's actually happening in the room, that's a whole other element. That's right there with Alfred Molina playing Russian roulette and the firecrackers and shit. That whole, if this does not make sense. Your brain is watching it, and you're hearing this totally upbeat song, and it just doesn't quite make sense. It's powerful. But it captures that that sort of drugged in like anything can happen scenario that a lot of drug addicts find themselves in, you know, at that whatever house this is or whatever, you never know when some violence is really going to come upon you. And again, I, I have to imagine maybe outside of the Wonderland influences, Paul has probably been in some sketchy uh, Coke situations himself. I would imagine so growing up in that area and having just flat out admitted that he did a bunch of Coke. Yeah. Yeah. I would imagine so. So that climax of the movie really is fucking brilliant it's just it's so good yeah and then it's just the wind down it's just a matter of uh putting the people in their proper places before the credits roll you know and uh dirk has to go back to jack he's got nowhere else to go and he left reed he just flat out fucking left reed on the street there that's we never find out what happened with that that always kind of irked me a little bit the two things about this movie kind of irked me that and uh the fact that at the end of the movie when jack's walking to his house and the camera's following him we see that uh, Jesse St. Clair, I think her name Vincent, was? Vincent, St. Vincent. Jesse St. Vincent. Uh, she's an amateur painter, and she's been painting portraits, and there's a portrait of Little Bill on the wall. And I remember thinking, oh, they commemorated the guy that killed their two other friends. I remember thinking, like, that's kind of fucked up. It's like, that's the dude? Like, he murdered two people that they knew and hung out with. That's a legit position, but it didn't bug me because 
it was a crime of passion, and they were much closer to William H. Macy, Little Bill's sure. character. He was his, his partner in terms of the set, and uh, it was just his wife, and his wife was banging some dude like she always did. It, any, it could have been anybody, right? It's just some, some party hanger on her. Uh, and at that moment where you do want to have some callback to what was a beloved kind of, you know, loser character, uh, but, uh, but yeah, he's still in everybody's hearts as they move into this new era of their sure. lives. So, yeah, that didn't bug me as much. Um, her her painting style bugs me. I'm not a big fan of uh, her yeah. painting style, but uh, again, it's another example of really well intentioned people trying hard to create and giving it full respect, and it's on full display and it gets honored. Um, and that's the way I think really we should treat art more often in our lives and try to be less judgmental about what a piece of work is uh, in the negative just in recognizing how hard it is to make a movie at all or make anything at all. It's hard to create words on a page. It's hard to create uh, oil on a canvas. It's hard to create anything. And so uh, at the core of this whole movie is is, is a love of creation, uh, even in its sillier kind of manifestations, right? Mm-hmm. Uh, and to have a sense of humor about it. But um, but yeah, that's that's partly what makes the movie so successful is – it treats it treats everybody's actions, no matter what it is, without judgment, and you can see the good intentions even amid bad circumstances. They're trying to lead good lives even amidst what is, you know, from the outside considered kind of a a, a low life kind of profession. Sure. Yeah. Yeah. That's well put. I just wanted to come and say sorry. You know. And, um. I, I just want to know if you could help me, Jack. I, um, I need help. He returns home, Jack, open arms, recognizing that Dirk has really, is what afforded him, like uh, a whole component of his career that he had been aspiring towards. And of course, everything kind of hits the fan. Uh, but they welcome him with open arms. And that again speaks to the family side. It's like, he was the son figure of Jack and Amber and mom and dad. They take him back in without question, without hesitation. And nurse him back to health. Yeah, that shot of Amber with him crying in her lap and she's stroking his hair and you know giving him water and stuff. It's very, very matronly, very motherly. Well, they, nur- they nurse him back to health and that's where we leave him in the uh, dressing room ready to get back on camera. And that is... The big reveal. Yeah, yeah, the big, big reveal at the very end of the movie. And he's uh, he's playing his character again, too. He's playing uh, Brock Landers, you know, return to form. And that scene, you know, is so blatantly Raging Bull, uh, yet another kind of Scorsese uh, reference point for it. But uh, it's okay. I mean, it works. It's a callback to the earlier scenes. Uh, there's lots of mirror-type talk, of which is pretty pretty standard in these types of things where people are trying to amp themselves up. It's a good device. Um, and then the big dick that the movie's been about actually comes out. Yeah, you actually get to see the big dick at the end. Yeah. So there's some closure there, right? <laughs> it's like yeah. Jaws. <laughs> yeah. Don't show the monster. Yeah. The, originally, I think they intended to show it in the first scene or the first sex scene, but... Back when they were aiming for the NC-17? Uh, I, no, I can't say that. I think that it was probably deliberately chosen to okay. not do it sooner in the process just because they understood that it was going to be... It was so much more fun to uh, see the reactions of everybody else, even in that first scene where Becky and uh, Reed are tilting their head to the right uh, and Kurt takes his eyes away from the camera. Yeah, and these are seasoned porn professionals, too. But And Scotty, you know, Philip Seymour Hoffman's just kind of like hot and lustful, like almost hyperventilating as yeah. the sound man. Goddamn, what a treasure. The colonel at the uh, pool party. That was wonderful, yeah. Jack tells me you've got a great big cock. <laughs> May I see it? <laughs> and just the uh, his his forehead, you know the, the the wrinkles in his forehead just go away as his eyes, his eyebrows. Paul raise. Thomas Anderson knows when to let that camera linger, man. And you know he he did it in in Hard Eight when uh, the lights come on and Sydney's looking around the room like, what the fuck is going on in here? But he never shows what's happening in the room, or he doesn't for a while. And when he lets the camera linger on uh, Dirk's face during the drug deal, and then the 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 colonel 
when he sees Dirk's dick and Dirk walks away. It's that scene's over with, and yet he's still just standing there looking in the same general area that he was just looking at, just with this dumbfounded look on his face. So yeah, it's sort of like the the, the shark in, in Jaws. Yeah, yeah, he's he's very good at that suspense. Um and yeah, with that, the movie ends with uh, a great cue of Living Thing by ELO. Living Thing. Yeah. As soon as the door The song starts with some strings, some orchestra strings, some violin stuff, and then uh Right when it cuts to black, that's when the song kicks in. Yeah. All right. Closing thoughts on Boogie Nights. We've covered a lot of ground. Yeah. Obviously, we're both big, big fans of this movie. Uh, easily one of my favorite movies of all time. I cannot recommend a movie uh, any more emphatically. It's uh, Don't be afraid of the subject matter. I mean, it's got some... It's an adult movie for sure, but it's not an adult movie. It's... it's uh, it handles all that. It handles the subject matter very tastefully. Boogie Nights for me remains uh, one of my favorite movies of all time. Just again because I saw it at a formative period in my life uh, as an early, you know, film lover, and appreciating so many of the influences that were on display again between Robert Altman or Scorsese. It's like it's fun to see those kinds of things uh, just be catapulted through this new, uh, this new kind of vision, right, of which PTA had, and it is. All of that ego uh, that we were touching on previously, it's like he's still, this is, this movie is the I'll show you of his entire life, right? For yeah. every for every instance where he met some sort of, uh, you know, obstacle or hardship or someone's questioning of his abilities, he packed it all into this movie in such a great way. It completely showed the range of what he is capable of at such a young age with such a level of craft and sophistication in the way this thing is put together that uh, made him a force that you couldn't ignore, right? Yeah, yeah, this was his coming out party. It's his second movie, but like we covered last episode, nobody saw a hard eight. Uh, but this was his big coming out party. He showed up, he put his stamp on the, on the world of cinema with this one, and it's because of this movie uh, that he still gets to do whatever he wants, really. I don't think he has much studio interference to this day. Well, it's certainly what gave him final cut on our next movie, Magnolia. And uh, so all of his hard work in maintaining his vision through to the end, right, fighting tooth and nail for every choice, finds a whole new level in Magnolia, which comes next. Yeah, that's where he truly had final cut. And uh, we will definitely get into that one uh, next time. Well, thank you very much, man. Uh, Boogie Nights is the best. Boogie Nights is the best. Go watch Boogie Nights right now. I believe it's streaming on Netflix. Nope. No? It Can't was find it recently. It was, but it went off. Ah, oh, that's too bad. No. Nope. Go uh, buy it. It's worth buying. Go buy it. Boogie Nights is the best in terms of a movie. I don't think it's his best movie, but I think it is the best in the sense that, oh, that movie's the best. Yeah. It's such a fucking great time. Sure. Uh, I'll, I'll quote Tarantino. I think that... Uh, there Will Be Blood might be a better movie, technically. It's, uh, but I prefer the exuberance of Boogie Nights to the formalism of There Will Be Blood. All right. Well, thanks very much, man. Hey, thank you. All right, so that's it for Boogie Nights. Uh, clearly, we're big fans of that movie. Go out and pick up a copy. It's available on Blu-ray and DVD, and it's chock full of fun and informative bonus content. Uh, There's no 4K release as of yet, which I find odd, but whatever. It's money well spent all the same. As usual, thanks to Will Fox, Harrison Holmes, Michael Eads, and Ross Warner for making this show possible. Filmography Club is brought to you by the hardworking folks at We Own This Town in beautiful Nashville, Tennessee. Be sure to check out the other podcasts in the We Own This Town family. Uh, Right now, I'm loving Ryan Briegel's My Fantasy Funeral. Fantastic stuff. Really compelling uh, work he's doing over there. Join us next episode when we take a good long look at a good long movie, 1999's sprawling and epic, Magnolia. Thanks for listening.